the abortion rate is actually higher than the birth rate in New York City. It's, it's a literal genocide. Community. It's a literal genocide under the definition of United Nations. A literal genocide. Thank you. I had a really productive conversation with the Black Lives Matter chapter at UPenn uh, two weeks ago, and it was really amazing because they showed up thinking that I was anti-black because, I don't know, they read EliteDaily.com or something weird. And I get to speaking and I say, you're focusing on 16, 16 unarmed, or about 16, it's actually decreased since 2016, unarmed black men that have been shot and killed by police officers. You have a higher chance as a black person of being struck by lightning. White people, white men and Hispanic men are more likely to be shot and killed by a police officer than any black man, right? Could you imagine if you refocused your energy on the 17, 18 million black babies that have been aborted since 1973, the 900 black babies that are aborted every single day? And I've said this before, and I will say it again. If Black Lives Matter changed their initiative to black babies, if they changed their initiative to talking about what's happening in New York with nine-month abortions, I would put on a BLM t-shirt tomorrow. We like having other opinions present, okay? So give it up for our first question, okay? I got the mic. All right. Hi. So uh, you talked about uh, promises made, promises kept. Right, about yes. Trump. Um, so I want to talk about some things that you have previously said in the past um, that maybe you would disagree with Trump on now. So the first thing is, uh, so Obama, you called out on, the other day on Twitter for increasing drone strikes and not getting us out of the quote unquote endless wars. So yeah. I want to know why you have not criticized President Trump for disagreeing with Congress trying to get out of the Yemen, trying to get out of Yemen why he has not gotten people out of Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Somalia, everywhere else around the globe. Um, and then also why you have not called him out for proposing 1.5 trillion in cuts to Medicaid, uh, 25 billion in cuts to Social Security, and well, 845 billion uh, in Medicare. Okay, I'll start with the first one. First of all, he is ending the endless wars. He's proposed troop withdrawals in Afghanistan. And so Syria. why did he veto a bill last week to get out of Yemen? Well, the, the Yemen conflict does not actually involve the United States except us selling weaponry to Saudi Arabia, which I actually oppose. If you actually look at so my So why did feed, you not announce that you so were opposed to why don't you him? type in at Charlie Kirk 11, Saudi Arabia, I, and I my, my comments on Saudi Arabia have been very, very clear. Yeah, but la this is the time where it would matter that you so, would actually say something. So would you, would you expect it. me to and have a comment on everything he ever does in the history of anything? Well, getting out of a war is kind of a big deal if you're saying you want smaller government, We're right? not fighting in Yemen. There's no U.S. troops. We're supporting a genocide in Yemen, actually. Okay. And if we didn't, I, I then we'd have it would not continue. Again, with the Saudi-led conflict there, I'm no huge fan of Saudi Arabia. They funded 9-11. They were behind 9-11. 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudi Arabian. I'm also very critical of Iran. I think a balanced, a balanced analysis of Middle East will show that both Saudi Arabia and Iran have funded extremism in forms of Wahhabism, in, in, in forms of both terror financing, Hamas, so Hezbollah. So why have you not called out President Trump who violated the emoluments clause by allow, allowing Saudi Arabian billionaires prior to his inauguration to buy spaces in ho his hotel in exchange for access well, to the Well, first of all, it's not a violation of the emoluments clause because they're independent customers at a property that he has a lease for. That's a really convoluted argument. Okay, but, so, it, but if so you're like, admitting again, that there's a conflict of interest in some asset and he's going to be the president tomorrow. So you think so that's okay? So when you have a multi-billionaire uh, running But you're so against these Saudi Arabian billionaires, properties right? across yeah. the world, you can't be accountable for the hundreds of thousands of customers that run through your property. The hundreds of thousands, as in the Saudi government who Hundreds of thousands of people. And by the way, so let me ask yeah. you a question. What did the Trump family and, and Trump enterprise do to any official or person affiliated with a foreign government that stayed any of their properties? What did they do with that money? I don't know. They gave it back to the government, because if you were so informed, you would know that. So that's how they, that's... <laughs> okay, so... So they actually, that's how it did not at all violate the anomalous clause. Okay, so they basically they tried, back. got caught, and then gave the money back. Sounds like a good plan. Well, no, they preemptively saw the potential issue and they avoided it. And so, again, if you want some agreement in Middle East, I'm happy to talk about 
how the U.S. has been actually, I think, too tilted then, in the direction. Then tweet one thing, one thing that's not about Obama in, and his drone strikes, but about Again, how Trump has increased drone strikes in his so, first so year That's not correct. Drone strikes have gone yes, down it, dramatically. Yes, it is. And I have praised. Have Google, look it up. Right. So right. I've praised. And also, he just. Right. Can I just say, in it's, it's his personal Twitter feed. So this is, I always find it weird when people tell me what to tweet. Like, I, I, I get your, you want to know what he thinks. says he's so angry about it. You want to know what he thinks, that's fine. You can ask about ending a single one. Tweet. By the way, I'm not the press secretary of the United States. This is like insane. Like you pretty much repeat everything that the press secretary says, don't you? Well, yeah, no, actually, you're talking head I expound for on I talk about different That's who things. funds your organization, and that's why you're, you're right. Here. We're funded Saudi by over 35,000 grassroots donors across the country with hundreds of oh, thousands those, those of grass students those on 1,400 high school college campuses across the country. Those grassroots donors that you won't make public because you don't want to... We you list over 200 of our so donors on our website. We're funded by some of the most successful entrepreneurs USA from the bottom up. There. And we love the hey, fact Charlie. that we are funded by job creators. Don't, Don't you love, love that the only, the only 501c3 organizations that they want to make their donors public are all conservative? Like, do you think he goes after all the, uh, the liberal ones and says make your donors public? Absolutely not. There's always a double standard. You probably don't go after all of the other liberal organizations I go after and say think make progress. And you told uh, them to make their, did you show up at their, who funds them then? And in what? So, so, so you asked them, did you tell them to make their donors public? I'm not with them right now, am uh, I? Yeah, I, I didn't think you did, right? There's a double standard. That's, this is a ridiculous I, I argument. I am against that. I'm for the Clinton Foundation. You want to talk about free speech? Why have you not said anything what? about Wiki, You're for the Clinton Wiki Foundation? Leaks. Saudi and Arabia Wiki. funded the Clinton Foundation, the yes, very exactly. country and you Wiki just Le said that committed genocide. Okay, okay, I got it. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so Saudi, Saudi Arabia, right? They funded the Clinton Foundation, correct? S say that what? Saudi Arabia funded the Clinton Foundation. Well, Do you know how we found out about that? WikiLeaks, right? Yes, that's how that information was released in the, in the, in the DNC emails, okay? So you have not denounced Trump at all for basically changing the way journalism functions by arresting Julian Assange, which is probably the most important free speech case all, in American history. He didn't arrest Julian Assange. The only person who's revealed war crimes other than from the Ecuadorian embassy and arrested by UK officials. Donald Trump did not go with handcuffs to, with to London and arrest Julian if you Assange. Don't, if you don't think that Julian Assange was arrested and is going to be extradited to the United States because he pissed Has off he the elites of this country, then you are clearly not informed on what Okay, so now you're going forward about things that haven't happened happened and you want Charlie to debate that? So you want me to okay. denounce a conspiracy oh, theory? Okay. Yeah, this a is, conspiracy theory? How that about hasn't the, happened. The, the Trump administration has attempted to Right, we're not informed about they, the future. They, you are they correct. They have said that they wanted to extradite Julian Assange, correct? Okay, but you just said that we were not informed if we don't think that they're going to in the future Okay, but what, what if they do? Will you, can you well, agree why are to we publicly this is so defend Julian Assange, have an imaginary who has revealed war crimes we can't have an imaginary committed by our government? Please tell me that you will denounce him being arrested for doing I, so. I refuse. Uh, first of all, I hope you never go to law school because you should never engage in a hypothetical or something that hasn't yet happened. Hasn't so happened. I refuse to engage it's a weird in debate. utopian conflicts. You, are, or, you straw man or, more than any other person that I've ever seen. So the fact you that facts? you're talking about hypotheticals is the most ridiculous Wait, thing so I've ever heard. So use one example of a straw man. Okay, you talk about taxes every time. You talk about how the black, or unemployment rate is so low. Yeah, Ta the lowest taxes, ever black. That's taxes Hispanic, are so low. Right. Do you want to talk, let's talk about new income. Where is new income wages going? Wages are up for the first time in 10 years. Okay, right. well, so in back. Missouri, manufacturing wages in Missouri over the last 15 years have gone up 15%, and wages have gone up 0.09%. So maybe if we stopped outsourcing jobs like President Trump is doing, then we could More actually do something You know that, that President Trump has the greatest increase in manufacturing jobs in the last 30 years? Well, over 500,000 why, why, why manufacturing has he not jobs called out, Why has he not called out GM? So let's get... Th right. we thank you for the spirited thank you for the conversation. Question, but we have a lot of other people uh, ask some questions as, as well. So thank you for the question. Thank we you. really appreciate it. Hi. I love this walk. It's like a walk. Hello. Uh, I want to hey. talk a little bit about capitalism, free markets. Yes. Yeah, so um, I know you mentioned uh, socialism and that being bad for Venezuela and other places, obviously. And I think we can all agree that capitalism is the best, I mean, it's really the best basis for an economy, right? Do you agree with that? Yeah. But do you think there's any middle ground, where, well, not even middle ground, but 
<laughs> anywhere that you can take some aspects from socialism and not be end up like Venezuela because I see places like Canada, the United Kingdom where they've implemented some socialistic policies like health care for all people. And that's a socialistic principle, but it's pretty popular in their countries and yeah. they don't seem to be turning into Venezuela. Yeah, everybody loves Canadian health care except for the Canadians. I mean, I'm being serious, I'm being serious. If you haven't seen it, there's, there's a great video on YouTube where Steven Crowder actually just goes to Canada. Have you guys seen this video? He just goes to Canada and he shows you what it's like to try to get healthcare. I mean, he's got no plot, he's got a hidden camera on him, he talks and he's waiting in a, a waiting room. He says that his arm is broken and he's in a waiting room, I think it was his arm, uh, for eight hours, four hours, four and a half hours before he gives up the first day. And he literally can't get healthcare, he can't get anything basic looked at him because this, there's the universal healthcare. I I literally lived with a Canadian for two years in New York City and she would tell me that if you had a real medical emergency they would come to America. Now I will, I will say this, we have our healthcare system is a disaster and it should, we need a, a major makeover. It's very frustrating because it's actually not an example of free markets, it's not. There's, there's collusion happening between the pharmaceutical companies, the insurance, we don't know yeah, what I'm, anything I'm costs. That up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We don't know what anything costs. That is not a, free markets means I can look at the price system, I can, I can make decisions as a consumer. You cannot do that in America. So there, there, in my opinion, I would love if Trump completely revamped it and made it so that there wasn't all of this, um, these, just these walls, you can't say anything, everything's invisible, and then you get a bill, and it's like, hey, you owe $4,000 for that time that you were in the emergency room for 20 minutes. Literally happened to me last year, but I'm not gonna rant on it. Um, and so Charlie and I, we talk about this all the time, that we, we, we do not like the American healthcare system, but we do believe that an actual, true, free market healthcare system would be best. And okay. the portion that, there's, there's two, two parts of this that don't get talked about. If you can pay for it, for the 1% of the 1% in America, we do have the best healthcare system in the world. But the question is, how do you get more people access to something that only a few people have? And that's markets. It's the only way that you get goods and products and services to more people. The second thing is countries like Canada and the UK and Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark have really, really high tax burdens to pay for it, which is not a compromise that I'm willing to put forth at 50, 60, 70 percent taxes on top of an 18 percent VAT tax that essentially is a sales tax. I'm not willing to sacrifice that much liberty and that much of my freedom for some bureauc bureaucratic nightmare. But the thing is, all of these countries benefit primarily off of the free enterprise medical engine in America for medical advancements, for drug um, breakthroughs, for patents. So over 90% of consequential medical advancements stem from the United States in the well, last 30 years. Yeah, but that's a little different from universal health care. But though, what health care are they using, though, in Canada? They're using American-based breakthroughs and well, giving them those, out to their citizens. Those breakthroughs would be protected regardless through patents. No, they're not. That's the, the difference is this. If you don't have a free enterprise, a profit incentive, there's no reason. In the NHS... Yeah, but those profit incentives would be still protected under patents. So, so can you name one thing the UK health system, the NHS, has done for medicine for breakthroughs in the last well, 20 years? I, they don't, it doesn't exist. I, I'm not any medical expert, so I'm not going like, to pretend no, I, I, but, I know all of that. What I'm saying is, is that those medical breakthroughs wouldn't be ended if we had health care. Like, so if you things. take the, if you extrapolate if if Bernie still, Sanders' argument and you get rid of all private companies in health care, that is his stated position, and any private enterprise in health care, and private hospitals, and private drug companies, and private treatment, that is his position. Then well, there I, I didn't ever said I was supporting any specific I didn't position. say you were, but he does hold a position that the Canadian health care system and the UK health care system is a model to be replicated, which is what you started your argument with, which is basically total nationalization. So in the United Kingdom, they have the NHS. They, there's very little entrepreneurial activity that happens in medicine in the UK, such as cancer treatment, such as diabetic medicine, such as open heart surgery. All these things that we have now seen save people's lives are primarily happening in America because there's some form of a profit. Now, is it a perfect system? Of course not, because it's, too, it's largely too expensive because we don't have the market that Candace talks about because of the collusion between the insurance companies and the hospital companies. It's more cronyism than it is capitalism. It is. And the it's parts, cronyism. And the parts that we have in America that allow for market-based treatment, such as LASIK eye surgery, we talk about this a lot, where it's a vital organ. LASIK eye surgery used to cost $20,000 for a treatment for eye improvement. Now it's down to about $2,000 for the treatment. How is that possible? It went down in price, but up in quality. 
it's almost all cash because the insurance companies refused to cover it. They considered it a cosmetic need, despite it being a vital organ. Now, in the next 20, 30 years, the question should not be, oh, Medicare for all, which is really Medicaid for all, by the way. It's not Medicare for all. And we have Medicaid in this country. You know, newsflash, 62 million Americans are on some form of government-issued health care called Medicaid. And the approval ratings for Medicaid are in the sub-10%. Sub people that actually enjoy Medicaid, the waiting lines, the things that aren't covered, and the, in, the, 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 the amount of waste in Medicaid is unbelievable. The other example of socialized health care we have in America is the Veterans Administration, which AOC calls a model for health care, which you have waiting lines, you have people literally dying on the phone waiting for treatment. The VA has a $180 billion a year budget. More than 50% of the VA's budget is spent on just administrative care. And so, I sympathize where you're coming from, but Candace and I and Brandon, we believe that markets have always worked. They've worked in everywhere they've been experimented. There will be outliers, there will be imperfections, but generally free things happen when you allow markets to exist. Prices go down, quality goes up, and more people get ac access to those goods over a longer period of time. Okay, well, I guess the biggest reason I think people, a large percent of Americans have been in support of a system like Canada and UK have where everyone else health care is because um, on the conservative side, there hasn't really been any specific plans to actually implement it. And before the election, Trump said everyone would have health care would be great. Haven't really seen much progress in that. So I'm wondering, like, what would the plan well, be and what would we do to actually look, I improve the situation? I think we've got six more years, and I definitely think he's definitely spoken about it. And, and because he's been such a deliverer on all of his promises, I, I genuinely do believe he's going to take up this issue. It's something that I'm super vocal about because I totally agree that the American health care system is a disaster. But my whole thing is I don't need free health care. I just want to walk in the store and have it be affordable, right? Like when you go to CVS, you're not like, I wish Tyl all Tylenol was free. You're like, oh, I can afford this, and you buy it. And I think that we can get to that um, if we stop all of the colluding between the pharmaceutical companies and especially the insurance companies which are scamming Americans in this moment. Thank you. Thank you so much Thank for your you. question. Thank you. Do we have a disagreement? We got a disagreement. Yeah, we got a disagreement. Bob Marley shirt disagreement. There we are. Hey, how are you? Maybe I'm seeing, oh, it's a cat Marley shirt. It's good. <laughs> I got to hold on to it for you. Okay, so in the beginning, you claimed America's greatest country in the world. I just Correct. wanted to hear you say personally why you believe that to be true. America is the greatest country in the history of the world. It's the most generous, most benevolent, most productive, most forward-thinking, most accepting, most uh, entrepreneurial country ever to exist. Um, we take in half then, the world's immigrants. Every year. Okay. I've then, seen Newsroom, so if you're going to have that moment in Newsroom where you, you issue all the stats and say, but we're behind in mathematics, and so, are you going to do that? Well, according to the United Nations... I've seen the Nation, show. Go ahead. Well, the United Nations could give you about 17 reasons why we're not the greatest country in the world. I've seen According newsroom. to their happiness report. Right. Okay, I don't, okay, that's really good. That's a great question. How do you measure wait, happiness, wait. by the way? But, but here's the question is... I'm is, really happy. Is greatness... <laughs> Well, our country does have pretty outrageous rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. Is that not an indicator of an unhealthy country? Is, but is, is greatness defined by happiness? That's an interesting question. Well, first of all, when you take in half of the world's immigrants and you have aspirational, upward-thinking people, the, the word that first comes to happy when you think of it is, are you comfortable with where you are? When you have a country that is based on becoming better tomorrow than you are today, you're not comfortable with where you are. Well, then where why is we just lose another finish? rank in the last year? Well, let me finish. Is that progress? I, what, I didn't I'm hear sorry, what you said. What did he say? Was, can you you say said it? you mentioned striving for achievement. That's based. Well, we just lost another rank in the happiness report last year. We were 17th. We're 18th well, now. So again, here's how I define striving for achievement. How about, guys? How about most medical patents that have saved lives, most valuable companies, most entrepreneurs of consequence, most the, the greatest capacity to strive to serve the needs and wants of other people, not asking for anything in return. 
90 out of 100 of the most valuable companies in America are, are from America, which comprises 5% of the world's population. I don't, think those, I don't think those medical patents are doing much good for everyone who dies from How about blood. polio? You think the polio vaccine helped the world? I think uh, opioids probably kill m more people than polio, so that's a little bit more on my radar. What, the, what is? The opioid crisis, have you heard of it? You think the opioid crisis is a solely American phenomenon? No, but... <laughs> Uh, and by the way, I do have a question. Could you name a country that's better than America, that's greater than our country? I could probably name about 17 right here. Because the United Nations, hold on, hold on. Well, well then, let, let on, me say this, let me say, I think you, I think you could Are you planning on leaving? What's up? Are you planning on leaving? Yeah, here shortly. Yeah, right. So I think you conflate two things. Bon voyage. <laughs> you, you're conflating two things, right? The country being great and people not appreciating it. That's two different things. This is the greatest country on planet Earth. Sure, if you value and, money. And, and whether, and, and this, is, this, is, this is what I have to say to respond to that, whether you're happy or not is based on your feelings. Because I'm happy. I don't want to live anywhere else, and I will never live anywhere else. And, that, and, and, and nobody can judge that, put that on a piece of paper, because nobody ever interviewed me about how happy I am. So I don't care about those silly uh, uh, tests and all these numbers that people put together, there's nowhere else in the world that you would want to live. And you say you do, but the reason that you're still here because it's the greatest country. There's nowhere in the world you could be free. There's nowhere in the world you can be as proud. There's nowhere in the, nobody in the world that can kick our butt militarily. So you, you feel free to go anywhere you want to go, but you'll be back to America, I promise. And, and this is one of the only countries where you can say what you're saying and say it's not the greatest and you not go to jail. I'm not right. saying, I'm, I'm not, I don't believe it's the greatest country, not anymore. That's fine. But, I mean, I'm not saying it's a shitty country, it's a good place to be. Like, it's a great country. Well, it's uh, listen, just, here's a, it, happiness, just so you know, is an impossible metric to measure. It's, it's absurd I to disagree. Me. It's, an absur it's absurd I, to me that they're saying they're, they're doing surveys on happiness. I mean, when, I'm a psychology defining, major, if I went around the world, good at, um, oh, well, yeah. oh, like, then you know, I guess you know, yeah, never mind. I'm, I'm pretty familiar with I guess with you know how happy I am. Good. Because you are a psychology major. I'm pretty familiar with how easy it is to measure I love these sorts happiness. of arguments. I majored in psychology, therefore I know how happy you are and how it can be defined. You what a bizarre thing You specifically know, say. but I'm just saying... It's an impossible metric. Your claim every, every, is that happiness is difficult to measure. The way people define happiness is different from I'm person to person. It is different from person to person. Some people define happiness in terms of how much success they have in their jobs. Some people define happiness by how much family time they can create. Some people define happiness by being alone and sitting alone with their cat. That's me, okay? Like, there's all different types of ways to measure happiness, so it's bizarre to me to think that they've created some mass survey at the United Nations that determines how happy we are in a nation. I have to say, I'm pretty happy too. I think the people in this room would agree that we love America, and I appreciate your psychology degree you're working on. Um, did, do you know that America takes in half of the world's immigrants every single year? You know, it's really amazing about our culture and our identity. We're one of the only countries ever to exist, actually the only country ever to exist, where it doesn't matter where you come from or what you look like or even what religion that you practice, when you come here, you're called an American. It's not the same in European countries, these countries with higher happiness index. If you come from somewhere else and you go to Sweden, they'll say, no, no, that's somebody else. Our Swedish identity is being here for hundreds and hundreds of years. Do you know that Americans voluntarily gave away $500 billion to charity last year? When there's a natural disaster, when there's conflict, you don't call the Belgians, you call the Americans. <laughs> when, when there was, when the communists were on the march in the Korean Peninsula, when the world was war weary, it was our boys from Missouri and Iowa and Minnesota that went halfway across the world, 30,000 Americans died so that South Korea could exist today to push back the communists. And we did not ask for any land in return. You know the only land we asked for? Was a land to bury our dead. No other country has voluntarily sent hundreds of thousands of their own citizens to die for the freedoms of others. No other country has taken in half of the world's immigrants and still be called bigoted and sexist and racist. No other country has had 90 out of 100 of the most productive companies with 5% of the world's population. And there's a reason why there's a waiting list that is double the size of our population to get into here. It's because we have a unique identity. And that identity is built on ideas. 
the idea of acceptance, tolerance, freedom, liberty, that you can have these conversations without the suppression of others. Thank you for your question. Thank you. We have to take the next question, but I, I will say that I, I always genuinely feel so sad when people say they don't think this country is great because if there's one thing, I, I used to have that mentality, and it's, it's sad. It really is sad, and it's lonely, and I'm, I'm sure he would disagree because he's majoring in psychology. Um, but what Trump has gifted the world with, and especially me in my life, is this sense of patriotism because there is nothing that makes you feel more united or happier or finally feeling like you've transcended against all the nonsense of identity politics and racism and sexism and feeling like you're a part of something than feeling love for your country. I just wanted to say that. Like, loving America is the best feeling in the world, and I hope he changes his mind one day. <laughs> Hello. Yep, you're good. I got it. Full disclosure, I believe climate change is real, but... It's obvious okay. that the world is not ending in 12 years. We all know that's a load of horse crap. And, <laughs> and so is the Green New Deal. But if free market capitalism is so great, how can free market capitalism solve the problem of climate change? Because Elon Musk, baby. Elon Musk. You want to talk about, you want to talk about our solution? So we, we, we obviously, we're Americans, we love competition, and I think that if, if the government, if, if, you, if you want to talk about solutions that we could be implementing, it's inspiring our young entrepreneurs to compete, to come up with ways to solve uh, plastic bottles in the ocean, right? How do we get rid of that? Well, get a bunch of pe young Elon Musks. Well, he, Elon Musk is, is, how old is he? Like 40? Upper 30s, something uh, like Probably in his mid-30s, but getting a bunch of young entrepreneurs or college kids to compete to figure out, of course they can figure something out. We, we can get a man on the moon. You don't think we could figure out how to deal with some of these issues like plastic bottles in the ocean, which is something that just bothers me. I'm not for banning straws, per se, um, but some of these bigger issues um, that I think everyone would be affected by, and you won't find an argument on the right on this. Conservatives aren't like, yes, more plastic bottles in the ocean, right? right. What we're against, really, is the idea that you're going to arbitrarily tax us and put together some agreement like the Paris Accord Agreement, which did fundamentally absolutely nothing, and somehow we've got to pay for it. Right. But if we did something that was inspiring, like in, in encouraging people to compete, to come up with new ideas, everyone would be on board tomorrow. Absolutely. The uh, Green Revolution would be fantastic for our economy. Pardon? The Green Revolution would be fantastic for our economy. It would create so many jobs. Right. It totally could. And I think, I'm on the left personally, but I think the right should have, should not let the left control the debate about climate change because so far the only talking point is that the left is for climate change that the stereotype is that the right doesn't believe in climate change that it's not an issue that nothing has to be done about it like it's business as usual and that's not true but free market capitalism the right the conservatives need to have an argument on climate change if the, if there's going to be a content if the right wants to continue in for 50 years for 50 years and i honestly believe that if we do not take action soon that china down the road will right well i i look i don't i don't think that's something that i don't think that we would disagree with the fact that there could be more of a discussion on the right about the ways to implement free markets and coming up with solutions that we would all feel comfortable with i don't think that we would disagree no, yeah, with that and i mean i trust entrepreneurs a lot more than i trust the epa yeah. and I find that the entire climate change discussion is really, really interesting to me because I was there when the first Al Gore movie was released in, you know, second grade or whatever, and all of our, you know, teachers taught it as doctrine. This was in 2002, and every prediction that Al Gore made in the first Inconvenient Truth has basically been proven wrong, such as polar ice caps melting and polar bears becoming extinct. What, sea levels rising to a place where we can't be inhabited anymore. Ha, please get in line and disagree with us, and you could do so enthusiastically. Thank you. Um, and, yeah, good. Yeah, knuckle punch for control. Um, because that's really what it's about. Climate change is about control. They, the climate change movement on the left. And you can, we can have a spirited discussion of solutions. We can have a discussion on the best way to go about um, addressing these things, but there's also some really important questions that we need to talk about. I have a figure, I have a feeling we're going to keep on talking about it with the I next question. I have a feeling too. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much All for right, your thank question. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Hi, I come from a very conservative family, and I have a lot of conservative friends, and I'm a... <laughs> but I'm a leftist, I'm a liberal, whatever you want to call me. Uh, I was just wondering if, do you think it's important for American citizens to value a healthy relationship between the two political parties? Well, first off, I want to say you aren't a leftist and you are a liberal, so I think it's important to distinguish that. Uh, leftists are intolerant and don't want to hear conservatives speak. The fact that you showed up today proves that you're a liberal and you will defend our right to be able to speak freely. So I, I just wanted to make that important. Don't, don't call yourself a leftist, you're a liberal. And we love to have dialogue with liberals. And I 100% I, uh, I think that there does need to be more productive dialogue. We do our part by ha having these events and, and we encourage them to, divide, to invite if there's the young Democrats. We want them to be here. If there are the young socialists, we want them to be here. We want you in the front of the line because the only way we're going to be able to have a productive dialogue about anything is if it, if it takes place really in these sorts of rooms, in a college environment where you're supposed to challenge your ideas so that you actually know what you think. Yeah, but well, what is the incentive for liberals to come here if, I mean, I just listened to you, my conservative friends just listened to you, and you blasted liberals for the past hour. Leftists. I mean, you blasted liberals. I mean, you're painting, Liberal you're painting, policies. You're painting liberals at this broad stroke of being leftists that are unpatriotic. But there's a difference, that, and I said this. I said AOC is splintering the party, and there are leftists and there are liberals. Well, when you, well, when you don't talk about the liberals and you just talk there's about like, like, leftists. There's like Alan Dershowitz, that's about it. Yeah, I mean, and, and in terms of a leadership, listen, in terms of a leadership, and, and I think that you're a sound liberal, and, and, and I think you can acknowledge this, is that there has been, in terms of a leadership in, in the Democrat Party, we are seeing a more radicalized movement. So we're here to talk about those radicalized elements because our hashtag is socialism sucks, right? Uh, people, <laughs> this, is, this is what we believe in. Um, and I'm sorry if we didn't make that distinction early on. I thought I did a great job of saying that if you're a liberal, we're happy that you're here. And uh, we always say that, but I do think there is a big difference between liberals and leftists. And I said that I think liberals will eventually end up joining more of our side because we are the tolerant runs and leftists are completely intolerant. I have a question for you. Have you, have you ever gone to a liberal speaker that's come on campus? N no. Never? No. Okay. I have not. I, um, I, I read Fox News, I read CNN, I read great. the Times, I read the journals, so I think, I think I'm a pretty fair voice to hear that's, in that's this. That's fine, but there is a point I'm making here which I would be dumbfounded, I've never seen it, maybe someone can correct, where a liberal comes on campus and demands the conservatives go to the front of the line to ask a question. That just doesn't happen. Our, our strive towards civility is this exactly, having tough conversations with people that we disagree with by demanding they go to the front of the line, that we can have debate, that we can have dialogue, we can have discussion, we can have discourse. But you I don't mean, see but that. I, this, is, this, isn't, this isn't debate. I okay. mean, when, when people, when conservatives talk about how Fox News brings liberals on, they have three conservative pundits bully a liberal pundit. That's what happens. And I mean, it doesn't that's take, that, okay, it doesn't, I, it doesn't I, take a liberal. It there's, doesn't no one take, that's, there's no one that's done more Fox News hits than me and Charlie, and there's no one that's done more debates on Fox News than me. And I'm telling you, I've sat across to liberals. It is not two people against one. It is one-on-one, -on -one and we have a discussion and debate. You can go on any YouTube clip, so I can debunk that as someone who's experienced it. Secondly, I'll say this. 80% of everything that is on television is catered for you, okay? Right. Let these people in the room finally hear their perspectives heard, okay? They, they, it is so rare for conservatives to be welcomed on campus. Everything that's being taught in the classroom is for you, okay? In a society that is catered towards liberals, where everything that they turn on TV is mocking them, Saturday Night Live is mocking them, okay? 80% right. of the news stations is mocking them, making it seem like they're uneducated, un unintelligent, and from the South. That's the perspective of a conservative Republican. It's okay for us to say, it's okay for us to stand up on a stage and represent conservative beliefs. And we have not been hostile, we have not been nasty, we welcomed you, we gave you an applause, and I'm glad that you're here. But don't make it seem like we're doing something wrong because we're allowing them to, for the first time ever, hear their ideas on a college campus. Well, what the, but the, here's, here's where you, mis, you mischaracterize me because there is a leftist media bias. So you're mis, you're mis, you're misusing, you're misusing your, you're Dude, misusing your compliments. opportunity. Learn how to get compliments. Like you to stood up and I said, I you're like a liberal, speak. thank you for being here. Now you're saying I'm mischaracterizing you. Are you going to go leftist on me? I literally handed you a compliment as soon as you stood up and I stopped you and I said, you are a liberal, you're not a leftist because you're here and we're glad you're here. What more do you want? I don't care if you compliment me, I want you to listen to me. And what, I'm trying to, say, and what I'm trying to say is that there is a leftist bias in the media. 
and you have a great opportunity, and a lot of conservative pundits have a great opportunity to provide a fair voice, and instead they do the same thing liberal journalists do and push agendas and narratives. What and did it we doesn't say that was somebody, untrue? It doesn't take somebody liberal to see it. Everybody sees it. What did we say that was untrue tonight? You just painted, it's not, it's not that it's untrue, it's just sweeping give statements. No, give me a fact. You're what not did, giving any facts. Give You're me, just pushing sweep, sweeping okay, statements. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the opportunity. What did we say facts. tonight that was untrue, that was us just pushing an agenda? It's not that it's untrue, there's just no snow. Okay, so it's statistics. true. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. What's up? Um, I just want to, full disclosure, um, I'm mainly conservative, but I disagree on your points to do with the environment. Like you said, the polar ice caps aren't melting. It's actually sea ice is melting, not the polar ice caps is melting. But I want to say, um, what do you think the government should do Oh, um, to combat global warming, but also a second part of the question? You, said, you talked about Elon Musk. Um, the petroleum industry is getting huge tax breaks compared to other green, um, different ways to produce energy. So that's why they're still leading the market. What do you think, Not why because you're in free market, why do you think that petroleum should get an advantage even though free market should be the way to go? First of all, we actually outwardly advocate for the abolition of all special interest subsidies in the energy market, in oil, natural gas. And to, it, it's only about $40 billion in subsidies. Now it sh still should be eliminated. Yes, only, because it's a multi-trillion dollar industry. The reason that it's predominant, our, our economy is predominantly natural gas, oil, and coal is because it's the cheapest way to provide energy to people. It's not because it's heavily subsidized. Now, most of the subsidies go towards offshore drilling and tax credits. Those should be eliminated. You know what else should be eliminated? Failed experiments like Solyndra, $500 billion of our taxpayer money going to a failed crony insider deal of Obama donors that were trying to make a solar panel company in California that went bottom up. That should also be eliminated. Please get in line. Thank you very much. And I'll tell you, as far as solutions, Candace and I are adamant that marketplaces and entrepreneurs are the best ways to solve problems, not government bureaucracies, not. He's coming back. No, no, this guy's needed. He already asked a question, didn't he? You're doing good, brother. So, I think we're on the, the Thrilla in Manila, then the Rumble in the Jungle. We can keep going, because all, they all ended similarly. Um, but, the, C Candace and I are very appreciative of entrepreneurs in the space, such as Elon Musk, that use market-based forces to solve these, these problems. And there's a huge thing that the environmentalists oppose. Would you consider yourself an environmentalist? Yes? I think everybody should, but yeah. Okay. I mean, I, lo I love the, environmental t the environment too. I'm just not a radical environmentalist where they want to shut down natural resource extraction. Nuclear energy is one of the great compromises that we could have today. I agree. You agree? I, it, yeah, now, it should be increased. For sure. it is, this is why I don't call myself an environmentalist, because they're the ones that are trying to close and shut down nuclear plants in America. So I think a common sense a common ground we can have is building more nuclear plants, which by the way, most of France's energy comes from nuclear, and they're shutting it down now. The environmentalists are trying to shut down nuclear. They have to so, from Germany, yeah. yeah. So, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. It. Hello. Thank hey, you for uh, being here. This is a really quick question. Uh, not gonna get into it with you guys, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, so, you know, you talked about Iran earlier in your speech, right, about um, the uh, nuclear deal, you supported the withdrawal from it, uh, and I'm sure you followed in the news these last couple of weeks the developments over there in Iran, the uh, lack of waivers for oil imports, the response from the Republican Guard, the designation of them as a terrorist group, right? Support so all those things. Seems yeah. Thing, yeah, things seem to be, you know, getting a little tense over there right now, you know, threatening to close the Strait of Hormuz, which is a third of the globe's oil supply. So 
If they were to do that and trap the United States Eighth Fleet in Bahrain, would you uh, support a war with Iran? No, thanks to Donald Trump and the energy deregulation in America, we're energy independent for the first time ever, and we have more oil that we have discovered in the Permian Basin than they have in all of Iran, and we can provide the world with all the oil and natural gas they need, and then some. We don't need to buy oil from terror financing, Israel-hating, American-hating maniacs that are ruling Iran. Thank you. Wait, hold on. I, 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 there's so many people that are in line. Like, I, yeah. I mean, why don't we put you in why a don't we just, pattern? I know you want to run Charlie's have... Twitter feed, but can we let somebody else ask a different question? Because you had a lot of time in the beginning. So, I know, but I'm, I'm sorry, but we need to get some other people. We do want other it's disagreement not fair. They've voices been in line. to be heard. I think I'm the first person to agree with you guys, so this will be a little different. But um, get a disagreement to the front of the. No, I'm kidding. So go ahead. I just uh, this is kind of like an open question for whoever wants to take it. But uh, so my question is, when left-wing office holders like Ilhan Omar and, a and uh, AOC being able to aggressively attack those who disagree with their policies, like the Green New Deal, which if you can call it a policy, and um, socialistic policies, and then immediately play the minority card, or how you said earlier, Candace, the victim card. Uh, when someone disagrees with them, how can someone like me, an average college student, be able to voice my opinion against policies and people that we disagree with without being labeled as a misogynist, a racist, um, by them or my peers? I mean, obviously voting is one way, but what's like another way that we can do here and now, I would say? Let me say this. The, the labels that people attach to you mean nothing, right? You're not a misogynist. You're not a racist. You speak the truth and you speak from your heart. That's what you do. Speak from facts. I don't care what these people say. If you have an opinion about the ridiculousness of Ilan Omar and these other politicians, express that. There's nothing stopping you. I, one thing that I, that I dislike is when I hear people, that, typically white students, say, well, I can't speak about this because they, I can't do it. Yeah, you can. They're the idiots. You're speaking the truth. Continue to speak the truth and don't worry about what they say. Thank you, guys. I appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone in line disagree or anyone in the audience? We want to have the disagreement call. Okay, we can keep coming. Trump 2094 hat or something like that. <laughs> Bar Baron for president. Hey. Exactly. All right, thank you guys for coming. Uh, mine's for Brandon. Uh, why is it that before I can even have an open dialogue with some people on the left, I've been called things such as a white supremacist mascot for being a constitutionalist? And why is it that I'm called a trader for wanting to pursue a career in law enforcement. You say, why are you called those things? Why am I called a race trader for wanting to pursue a career in law enforcement with individuals on the left? Because this is what I was talking about earlier. People are insecure, right? You are breaking the mold. People aren't expecting you to be wanting to be a police officer. These people, some people that are criticizing you have been conditioned to believe that they're, they're worth nothing. They've been conditioned to believe that police officers are out here killing black people when it's not true. And they're afraid because if you go on and make it, you're going to dismantle every single lie that they've been telling these young people all this time. I was a police officer. You should follow your heart, do what you know is best. And initially, people are going to ridicule you. The same people that say they love you, they're going to turn on you when you become a police officer. But when you serve and you show as an example, they're going to start changing their hearts. You're going to be the one that showed them that policing in America, if that's what you choose to do, is actually a good, solid, moral profession. Because they know you're a good man, and when they watch you do it on a day-to-day -day basis, they'll begin to change their minds. I'll tell you this, don't ever let anybody call you a traitor, because I don't care what perspective you come from. In my mind, in my heart, everybody's God's children. It doesn't matter what color you are. And I believe God doesn't care that you want to pursue these careers because you're his son and he supports you 100%. And I say, just keep fighting, man. People will come around. I've been ridiculed. You'll be just fine. Thank you. God bless you. Hello. I'd like to greet everybody. Hey, thank you all for coming out here tonight and you know, supporting free speech that helps make this nation so great. Um, I, I kind of want to learn more about the family role uh, and your, your all's opinion on that. Um, specifically, if you could outline some policies that Democrats have had in yeah. the past. So the number one thing that the, that the left did, and I'm talking about the black community, but this pertains to everybody that takes welfare 
um, it actually incentivizes father absence. So here's how it works. Uh, a lot of my people, a lot of people in my family are on welfare, so I've gotten to witness this firsthand. Um, they, the government gives you more money if the father is, does not live in the home. There's actually a government department, their job, these government agents, is to go around and knock on the doors and to make sure, to check that the man does not live in the home. So you get more money, right? So what does that say to the woman? Okay, well, I want a welfare check, but I want a bigger welfare check, so I'm just not gonna have the baby daddy live at home. If you're a single mother, you get more money from the government. Um, so that is the mentality that encourages father absence in the black community, it's become a plague. It's, it's actually worked, and that was implemented by um, Lyndon Bain Johnson and his Great Society Act, and we've been suffering for it ever since. Uh, does that answer your question? Do you want me to go into any I mean, more detail? Any any other policies you can you can share? I, I just kind of want to learn more absence? about this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, about father absence? Uh, I, Brandon, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I just want to add to that. I also, in addition to that, it, it really creates an environment where men can be cowards, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can go and lay around and have a child, and you don't have to take responsibility because the government has taken your position. Which is, which is unacceptable. And it also decentivizes or, or make it to where people don't want to get married. So they're sitting and living together, but they're not putting their finances together and being, I guess, consistent. Because if anybody look at statistics, when you're married, you do better. People that are very successful people are married. Two incomes will be the fastest way to pull you out of poverty. So I think that it, it, it creates an environment where people are not getting married like they should. So I think those policies have that residual effects, which hurts children and hurts the growth of, of particular communities, not just black communities, but any community that's, that's And I want to give you that. some more, because a lot of things that people talk about, and you, you'll hear the black community say, oh, you're sending our men to prison, you're sending our men to prison. Sending our men to prison is actually directly related to father absence, and I'm going to tell you why by quoting Barack Obama, okay, because he was the one that actually first brought this up. He, he brought up what father, father absence does, right? You remove the father, everything else falls apart. If you grow up without a father in their home, you are 20 times more likely to end up in prison. You are nine times more likely to drop out of high school, and you are six times more likely to lead a life of poverty. You, if you talk to any black American about the problems that are facing our community, they'll bring up prison, they'll bring up the school system, and they'll bring up the fact that we're impoverished. No one will talk about father absence, which really is the source of it all. Yeah, thank you. I've got a second part to it as well. Um, again, if, if you could kind of also talk about family roles being broken down, and if you think that the family unit is, is static, and, and if it's able to be, you know, if it can change and be dynamic um, throughout time? Um, no, I think it's the most important thing. I, I think it, 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 beyond it just being biblical, the most important thing is to have the family intact. Um, and, and because what happens when you break down the family is, let's think about what happens to the youth, right? They're still going to pursue that paternity. They're still going to pursue that maternity somewhere else. And what's happened, and I speak obviously specifically about the black community, but any broken family, is that they will go look for that paternity elsewhere, and where they tend to go to is culture. Right? So when you can't get your values from mom and dad, you start thinking Beyonce and Jay-Z is the way that you should live. You start listening to a hip-hop track and you start to glorify. This is why, if you pay attention to the left, they will always have Beyonce or Jay-Z. What do we have? Chrissy Teigen and John Legend at the DNC, whatever it was, a couple of weeks ago? Because they want them to start glorifying celebrities. And in, in our opinion, and Charlie and I talk about this all the time, as you see this, this removal uh, or, or almost the stigmatization of people that believe in God and believe in the Bible and culture, it's, it's permeating culture, right? They mock God. They mock religious people. They mock Vice VP Pence for being faithful to his wife. That's a bizarre thing, right? He's faithful and honors his wife, and they mock that. Why? Because if you really want to put forth socialism and you want to grow government and you want the government to have control of everything, you have to make sure people have no values. You have to make sure that they don't believe in God first and foremost. You have to make sure if they do not believe in the family, they have to believe in nothing but themselves. They have to fundamentally be atheists, which is what they're pushing in society right now. They have to believe Kim Kardashian is a, is a demigod. They have to believe in fundamentally nothing and everything else follows. So to me, the first thing that we need to return to is the home. There has to be a strong home and a strong center and strong values. And for me, as a man of faith, I, I, I believe this to the day that I pass. Jesus is the head of the church, the man is the head of the house, and that's the way it should be run. And I, I honestly believe the reason why we don't structure it that way is because people have been brainwashed and become and feel very insecure. A good woman should find herself a really strong man 
that's going to take care of the household. And, and, and just because a man is the leader, that means he's the only person in the household and the only person that has something to say. Because behind, or you say behind, beside, with every great man that you've ever seen is a phenomenal woman. And I think we need to get back to those principles and we'll be more successful. Thank you. Okay, just a couple more questions. Um, so growing up in rural America, one of the big issues that um, is really re prevalent right now is the opioid crisis. How do you suggest that um, either the government or students as uh, individuals, how do you suggest we go about uh, tackling this crisis? It's a community effort. It's a community effort. Obviously, we need to vote for policies that's going to restrict opioids from entering into our country, like building the wall, uh, supporting border security, and things like that. Also, law enforcement has a, a, a critical part in this because we can't uh, soften up law enforcement and make them weak to the point where we won't go out and arrest people. I I'll say this, and this may hurt some people's feelings. Being hooked on drugs is not a, is not a uh, what they call it, an illness. It's a, it's a choice that people make. My, my, my uh, stepfather died from heroin overdose because he chose to, to do heroin. I could have used drugs, but I chose not to. Now, once you hooked on it, now you may feel like it's a disease. But we need to treat that as a crime in law enforcement. And then when people are hooked, we can give them avenues in which we can help them rehabilitate. But beyond that, you have to arrest people that are pushing these drugs, and you have to arrest people that are in possession of these drugs. And then also in connection to that, I think that you, young people, you guys can be informed. Don't go out to these parties and get involved in that. Don't try that. When you go and get medication, especially when I go to the doctor, unless I'm in dying pain, I do not take um, prescription medication. I was just going to say not. that. The, pharmace the pharmaceutical industry has contributed to this in, in a regard, and no one's really talking about it, and it's exactly. disgusting, okay? <laughs> we are the most over-prescribed nation on the planet. They over -prescri You can't get the medicine that you can get for nothing. You have to literally be coming in bleeding, like your arm has to be off to get the medication that you can get if you say you have a tummy ache at the doctor. I have a tummy ache. Okay, take this. It's really heroin, but, you know, and good luck. Now what happens is these people get addicted and they only have one prescription. They can't get it refilled. So what do they do? They turn to the streets to get that same dose. And, and this is the role of parenting. This is the role of, of a strong family. Your kid will be okay if you get his wisdom teeth pulled. Okay, he's going to survive. It's a little bit of pain. I did it. Uh, don't let these doctors over-prescribe your children. Be there every step of the way and make sure they're extremely educated about it. This is a discussion that needs to happen at a higher level, but it's one that I talk about all the time because I'm like anti-pill. I won't take it for almost anything. I won't take pills. And don't think it won't happen to you. That's, that's the biggest thing I can give people. Don't get involved in it. Don't try it. Don't test it, even with medication. Don't think that it won't happen to you because you can, you can fall victim to it. Is there a specific legislative policy that would um, advance our goal to eliminate the, or, or mitigate this crisis? Well, I think, well, well, yeah, I mean, the wall, by ending the supply, it's way too superfluous. And then we have to admit that the Portland and the San Francisco trial run of having injection sites is a ridiculous idea and a total failure. Because to just make access to actually using the drug more accessible is actually increasing the usage in San Francisco. They've never had as many syringes and as many drug users in Portland and San Francisco. There are other ways to address opioid addiction than just having access to it street side. There are recovery clinics, there are, there's essentially an alcohol anonymous equivalent for opioid addiction where they will wean you off of the drug that you might be chemically addicted to. Um, and so I, the, on a city-based policy, that's been a total and complete disaster. And then, yes, I mean, I think Candace brings up a great point, which is um, to, the, to the aspect of where these pharmaceutical companies are pushing forth these really horrendous drugs to people and the, and the doctors are in collusion with these pharmaceutical companies, they should be held accountable. And, you know, you have to choke off the supply where you can't get it as, except, you know, as, as easily as you can, which obviously the wall will do. And 90% of all the fentanyl and all the opioid in this country come across the southern border. 90% of all the drugs that are killing our friends, because I have friends that are hooked on opioids too. Every, almost everyone in this room, I guarantee, does. And then the final thing is one of the STEM causes, two big STEM causes of why people go to them is underemployment in rural America and lackluster education, thanks to the public sector teacher unions. I really believe that improving our educational system through school choice, reinvigorating parents to make better decisions, and then entrepreneurs revitalizing rural America will result in less people going towards these horrible, horrible substances 
because they have they believe they have no other options. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is this, is this the last question? I think so. Last question. Hey, I was just wondering what y'all's opinions are on the libertarian stance of the Second Amendment, which is that generally citizens should theoretically have access to high-capacity firearms since the original purpose was to defend from a potential government takeover. No, so the question, just to repeat it, was what the libertarian's interpretation of the Second Amendment to have um, access to high-capacity firearms in potential government takeover. That was your question? Yeah. Okay. Good. Just clear. So, I mean, I could start, but sure. um, as, as comfortable as, or as uncomfortable as people might want to have this conversation is um, every one of the Bill of Rights, we have limitations. I think we should have less limitations on some of them, um, generally not more. So the right to bear arms, you have to look at it in context of what that actually meant. A militia back then, by the way, was basically every male under the age of 30. It's a really important context to what it was actually, the Second Amendment was intended for. Um, I mean, I'm of the position that persecuting law-abiding citizens and taking away their firearms when the root causes are nowhere near that is just a strive towards control. Now, do I think that, you know, every person, that people should have access to nuclear weaponry? Of course not. I mean, that's, that's absurd. Do I think people should have Abrams tanks, you know, in, the back, in their backyard? No. So there are, there are some reasonable regulations that we put forth. Um, and I think that some of them, you know, with a, with a particular amount of licenses should be curbed back. But, to, again, the conversation always, when it comes to guns, goes in the direction of taking away something from somebody who did nothing wrong. That always, and always when it comes to guns and firearms, it's never about root cause, it's never about enforcing the law, never about having more people that have guns to actually protect themselves. The conversation almost always, go, always goes away, goes towards how do we penalize people that did nothing wrong that have just been following the law? And Brandon, as a former police officer, could have another comment on that. Yeah, and I have my AR-15 in my house right now, and it's real pretty. And, and I'll say this. I, you know, if, if they, 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 they're going to have to come with a compelling reason to tell me not to carry my AR. Because the thing about it is that that's the gun that I want to use if somebody comes in my house. It's, it's more effective. It has more accuracy. I have more rounds. It's more intimidating. I have my tack light on it. I have an optic on it. Don't say you got a bump stock. I don't have a bump stock because I don't need it. You know, so I, I think it's, it's I, I don't want to hear people complain to me about, about an AR-15 because when you look at their argument, they're arguing that it's somehow killing a lot of people when anybody that's killed unnecessarily is, is a bad thing. But handguns are, are way more dangerous and are, are doing way more problems than, than AR-15s are. People are getting stabbed to death more than they're getting shot with AR-15. So the argument in and of itself is BS. But what I will say is that American citizens have the right to carry those guns. And because the same people that's telling you to put your guns away are the same people that's, that's bolstering the government. They, they claim to hate police officers. Yet, they want all the police officers to have the guns and none of us have guns. And, and I look at, so people may disagree with what happened at um, the ranch, but I think it was, I forget the guy's name. My memory is bad. Too many Bundy. football concussions. Bundy's Ranch. But when things like that, when it, you're, you're confronted with things that they believe are constitutionally incorrect, they have a right to defend themselves, you see how that went. The government did not come and onto their ranch and take over the things that they were ascribing to. When listening to some of them speak, I heard one of them in, in person, the government seemed to be at, wrong in that situation. But I feel like that we should be able to carry uh, firearms unless they have a compelling reason like not having a tank of nuclear weapons, then I don't want to hear nothing they have to say. Dan, I think I would just add here to wrap up just two things. I always find the argument about 2A to be moot. I think there's two things I really do believe that are true. America will never be a socialist country and the government is never going to come take our guns. We are never going to repeal 2A. It's just never going to happen in this country. All right. Well, um, closing comments, Candace? Um, did you say, what did you say, pros and cons? Closing comments. Oh, I was going to say. Um, closing comments. First off, we are, are just so grateful for all of you guys for showing up tonight, and we are going to stay in this fight. We hope you do, too. Have your voices heard. Feel encouraged. Go out. Wear your MAGA hats. I wear it to every single airport. Be who you are. 
Um, we are in a unique, we are in a unique place in this country. But if we fight, we will win, as Brandon always says. And God bless, and thank you so much for having me. And this, this is the last stop on what has been an unbelievable campus tour. I think we have spoke, and just in a live capacity to give some statistics, to well over 8,000 people across the country. Um, millions and millions of people on live stream, tens of millions of people on the videos that we've already gathered, and eventually that will be hundreds of millions of people throughout the years. And um, Turning Point USA is just so dedicated to educating this next generation. If you're not yet involved, you can find the red shirts, but they're the farthest thing from being communists in the front lines <laughs> here. And um, please get involved. For the adults, please have your kids get involved or support us any way you can. What an honor to be in this fight. And Candace and I both, and Brandon, all of us, thank you guys for supporting us the way you did. And uh, the fight continues. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.